So let me show you what untreated ADHD is likely to have associated with it over time. And this is from my own longitudinal study and others. First of all, school is the major area of impairment, but we all know that. They're more likely to be held back in school. A third of them quit high school without finishing. Only 5 to 10 percent ever finish college. So undereducation is a classic ADHD impairment. But that, of course, is going to lead to problems in the workplace. And you can see the ones that we've identified here. And it's also going to lead to problems in driving, because we know the single biggest cause of auto accidents in the North American population is in-vehicle distraction. And this is a distractibility disorder. So no surprise, they're going to have problems. But they have problems at all levels of driving, as you see here. More speeding tickets, more car accidents, multiple accidents, worse accidents. And as a result, they're going to have their licenses suspended three times more often than other people. So driving becomes a major problem. In fact, as has been said, there is no disorder that interferes with driving to the degree that ADHD does. So this is a major area of impairment, which is why your Canadian Pediatric Association has now recommended that if pediatricians see a teenager who's about to start driving and they have ADHD that is at least moderate in severity, you need to medicate them while they drive. I would say that that should be the case for nearly all clinically referred people with ADHD. Because if they're clinically referred, they probably at least have it to a moderate to a severe degree. Why is that? Because you can kill yourself. And you can kill other people as well with a motor vehicle. And we don't want to see that happening. Now, in addition to those, there are some other areas of impairment, not the least of which is managing money. As they move away from home, as they get jobs, as they get credit, as they borrow money, as they take out car loans, we start to see them having troubles paying their bills, paying them on time, so that they get their utilities turned off, their cars repossessed, their credit rating is terrible, because you've given a very impulsive person credit. Is there a and, for that? No. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, could we use that these days, huh? <laughs> Everybody working for AIG would go on this. <laughs> But this is an area that very few people took a look at. But duh, I mean, it makes perfect sense when you phrase it as a disorder of self-control given a credit card. And now we can understand what's going to happen with the, uh, the credit problems. So obviously, they need more accountability in their financial management. Social problems are going to continue into adulthood for many, though not for all of them. They often, as adults, describe themselves as having trouble sustaining long-term relationships, particularly dating and marital relationships. Uh, or partnering with people, uh, and we will see that they do experience divorce at a higher rate than other people do because of these difficulties. An area now that has been studied more in detail um, is the area of sexuality. We do not find more sexual disorders, so pedophilia, transvestism, or other difficulties are not more common in this population. What we do find, as you would guess, knowing an impulsive person, is greater risky sexual activity starting to have intercourse a year earlier than other teenagers, having more partners because they don't stay in dating relationships as long, not using contraception because they're so impulsive, all of which leads to a tenfold increase in teenage pregnancy. We now know, in fact, there is no better predictor of adolescent pregnancies than ADHD. In my study, 32% of the boys had fathered a child by 19. 68% of the girls had been pregnant at least once before 19 years of age. So this is a disorder that predisposes to becoming a parent very young. And by the way, we saw the same thing in the parents of these kids as well. And that's because their parents have ADHD also. ADHD in adults leads to earlier parenthood than the general population would be experiencing. And then, of course, notice a fourfold increase in sexually transmitted disease. So we have a group of individuals who, if not treated, are going to be experiencing impairments in every major life activity we have studied. There is no domain of life free of the influence of ADHD that we have yet identified, which is why we argue now for longer-term treatment across the week, across the year, and especially through adolescence, because most children, if they're on medication, it's for three years or less. And if they're in treatment programs, it's only for a few years or less. And what we have found in these studies is that childhood-only treatment was useless, useless in terms of changing the life course of these individuals. Now, to understand why these d disorders, why these impairments, that is, would continue into adulthood, we need to go back and understand that it's a disorder of self-regulation. 
and it's a quantitative deficit. So that begs the question, how far behind is this child? And so the rule that I have taught for years in our clinics to families, and it remains a very good rule of thumb, is the average ADHD child is 30% behind their age. Some are even more. But on average, across all ADHD children, it looks to be about 30%. So here's what I want parents to do. If your child is 10, he has the self-control of a 7-year-old. That is how long he can persist. That is how long he can remember. That is how long he can go without supervision. His ability to self-organize is that of a 7-year-old. Now, what would you do for a 7-year-old? How would we arrange homework? What else would we be doing around chores, around social functioning, around independence from parents? You wouldn't be doing as much as you would with a 10-year-old. You would not allow as much responsibility, as much freedom, as much independence. So I want parents to be lowering their expectations to the child's executive age. What is his self-regulatory age? It's 30% younger. All right, that's what you can expect. And if you are expecting more than that, you're my problem because you're causing the conflict. You are like a parent of a dyslexic child demanding normal reading. You are like the parent of a mildly retarded child demanding normal self-sufficiency, normal cognitive development. You're my problem because you just don't get it. So I want you to get it. It's a 30% lag. That's where they're at. That's what you can expect. If you're asking for more, you're going to have to do something to rearrange that environment to allow them to show what they know. But if you don't do anything, they're going to be about 30% behind. So what does that mean at 16 about giving kids a license? Are you out of your mind? Right? You just gave an 11-year-old a motor vehicle. And you're shocked to see the driving consequences. Right? You may have an 18-year-old who's one of the few that's going to go on to college. He's 12. That's his executive age. How would you have to design a campus if 12-year-olds were showing up to go to school? Those exactly are the accommodations you have got to make on that campus for this person. Pretend they're 12. More hand-holding, more accountability, more reporting to student services. You're going to get more curriculum materials. You're going to study in groups with older, more competent students. You're going to be in a substance-free dorm, and you are going to be accountable to student services four times a day for the work you're doing. In other words, we're going to treat you like you're 12. Right? And then you might just get through. But what do we do now? We send you off, you fail the first semester, and everybody wrings their hands of, oh, what are we going to do? We're going to have to change the campus. We're going to have to change the environment to suit the executive level, not the chronological level. So you need to understand the 30% rule because it applies to everything. I have a 14-year-old daughter with ADHD. Should she be allowed to babysit? Are you crazy? Right? <laughs> This is a nine-year-old being given care of an infant? No way. I don't care if she finished the Red Cross babysitting course. I don't care if she's got a certificate. We don't let nine-year-olds attend three-month-old babies unsupervised. And that is her executive age. You think this is hypothetical? We have legal cases of people even into their late teens and 20s who have killed babies out of anger, out of impatience, out of immaturity, out of not knowing what to do when the baby got upset, and then their emotion comes to the forefront. So we don't want to go there. So you should be looking at all of these avenues of independence and applying the 30% rule to them. And that's what you allow. And if you are going to give them more, you better be doing something to see that they can handle it. Okay, we want you as a parent to understand that every treatment plan has to have these four components or it's not going to work. Component number one, you've got to get a good evaluation. You have got to see an appropriate, knowledgeable professional. It doesn't matter whether it's a developmental pediatrician, a child psychiatrist, a child psychologist, or a behavioral neurologist, as long as they are well-trained and knowledgeable about ADHD. That's the trick. It's not the degree. It's the knowledge, it's the training, it's the experience. Do they see lots of ADHD kids and families or adults? So we need an evaluation because 80% of these people have another disorder, and that's going to need to be treated as well. Next, families need to educate themselves. We'll talk more about that. But you need to become an expert about ADHD or you're not going to know how to deal with it. Attending this afternoon has been a big step in that direction. 
Third, you need to understand that medication is the most effective thing we have. And that doesn't matter to me whether you like that or not. That is a statement of fact. We have no more effective interventions than these medications, which is why in the last decade we have moved them up in our priority of using them. It used to be that we would try everything else under the sun first, and only if they failed, go to medication. Well, guess what? 80% of them failed, and we went to medication anyway. And we should have started with it to begin with, because it would have made them more amenable and more susceptible to the other psychosocial educational programs we were trying to do. So don't be surprised to learn that up to 80% of ADHD children will be on medication at some time in their developmental period, whether that is childhood or adolescence. Because there are times and places where you cannot institute a psychosocial treatment. If your child is driving home from the homecoming last night, which was over at the Delta Hotel, by the way, I checked in and there's a prom going on. <laughs> you can't be there handing out tokens for following the speed limit. You know, this is idiotic to think that behavioral interventions are as good as medications. They're not. Where they're done, when they're done, they're good. But there are places where they can't be done. And now what do we do? The medications fill those gaps. So that's why we use them, and that's why you're seeing medication on the increase in both of our countries. And it is completely rational to do so. Then we make accommodations. That's what I meant by altering the points of performance using those five strategies we talked about, externalizing information. You need to create prosthetic devices in these places to help them show what they know.